Dear Mr. Congressman, as a friend, I feel an obligation to explain to you why I cannot support you in the charity appropriations bill. And my conviction stems from an incident that happened just last winter. You may remember the night. It was frigid, or as some would say, colder than a beaver's tooth and ten times as destructive. I thought I saw him nod off in session there. <laughs> oh. Colonel Crockett, this is a night when a coonskin cap would be the more appropriate attire. Yes, sir. <laughs> Although coons have more sense than to come out on a night like this. <laughs> right. Colonel Crockett, all of Georgetown, it's on fire. What? Good God. Oh, no. Well, let's see if we can help. <laughs> the next morning, in a flurry of noble passion, my colleagues and I introduced a bill appropriating $20,000 for the relief of the good people of Georgetown. All other business was put aside so it could be rushed through. Oh, how you doing, old timer? Fine, thank you, Sage. You're doing a great job in Congress. You can count on my vote anytime. Well, thank you, I appreciate that. Yes, all right. Mr. Bunt, almost forgot your change. You're a fair man, Mr. Higgins. I appreciate your time. Oh. This is for your son. I overheard him say he'd like one. Why, thank you, Mr. Bunsen. He's often told me about your carving. Thank you. See you next week. Uh, good morning to you, sir. I'm Colonel Crockett. And uh, I overheard your name to be Bunts. I believe there's a man named Bunts in my district. I believe you're right, Colonel. Well, if you're headed home, Mr. Bunts, I'd appreciate uh, riding along with you. It's not often I get a chance to jaw with my constituents. And since it's just... Since it's election time. Well, yes. All right. I'll get my horse. I had heard about this man from various sources. He was not what you would call sophisticated. He had a reputation for having a shrewd political eye. And I thought if I played my cards right, his influence could make my candidacy untouchable. But the ride proved to be uh, uncomfortable in more ways than one. So, Mr. Bunce, you expect anyone to oppose me in the election this next term? Hey, this jerk in myself. I like it hot. Well, well, as I understand it, Mr. Bunce, I won't if I have your help. A word has that you're a man of influence in this county. Uh, what is your opinion of my first term in office? Well, Colonel, I think you've done some... darn noble things. And some criminal ones. I will never vote for you again. Criminal? You said criminal, Mr. Bunce? I demand an explanation of what you meant. Forgive my seeming rudeness, Colonel. I didn't mean to insult you. But last winter, you raised a vote I just can't overlook, which shows, in my opinion, that you have neither the capacity to understand the Constitution nor the ability to be guided by it. I'm afraid I don't follow you, Mr. Bunce. I recall no vote last winter upon any constitutional question. Didn't you vote for a bill of $20,000 to relieve some sufferers of a fire in Georgetown? Well, Mr. Bunce, I do admit to that, certainly. But I doubt that anyone could complain about a great and rich nation like ours, given the insignificant sum of $20,000 to relieve suffering women and children. Colonel. If you have the right to give to one, you have the right to give to all. And since the Constitution neither defines charity nor stipulates the amount, 
you are at liberty to give whatever you think proper to whomever you darn wish. So you see, Colonel, this opens a big barn door, not only for fraud, corruption, and favoritism on the one hand, but for robbing the people on the other. No, sir, Colonel. Congress has no right to give charity. Well, Mr. Bunce, you seem to be one of those men who likes to criticize without providing any solutions or alternatives. Colonel, I dare say if any of the individual members of Congress had felt any real sympathy for the people of Georgetown, they or some of them wealthy men in and around Washington could have given $20,000 without so much as a sneeze. No doubt those same folks applauded you the loudest because you relieved them of the necessity of giving by giving what was not yours to give. So you see, Colonel, you have violated the Constitution on what I consider a vital point. It is a precedent dangerous to the country for when Congress begins to stretch its power beyond the boundaries of the Constitution, there's no limit to it, and therefore no security for the people. My place is just up ahead here. I tell you, Mr. Congressman, in that moment, all the praise I had generated for myself because of my so-called noble Georgetown deed grew as worthless as the dust on my congressional boots. I wanted to argue with him, to, to justify at least some part of my action. But as I sat there, searching desperately for a point to contest, I saw that there was none. Because this simple farmer of remarkable intelligence and insight was absolutely and totally right. Oh. You can drag the horse up over there. As embarrassing as this is for me, I do admit to you, sir, that if I'd had your clear, hard sense and understanding of the Constitution, I'd have put my head in a cannon before I'd given that vote. I, uh, I realize that asking for your support would be pretty presumptuous. But if you'll vote for me again, I'll give you my solemn word as a United States congressman and a gentleman that I will never vote for another unconstitutional law so long as I live. I tell you, sir, Mr. Bunce had the uncanny ability to make a man sweat like he was caught between a she-bear and her cub. I didn't quite know what to expect next. Colonel, if I recall, it seems to me you made that same promise once before, when you were sworn into office. However, personally, I think I'm in favor of giving you another chance on one condition that you make the same apology to the folks around here that you just made to me. Now, if you do that, I'll see what I can do to push what little influence I have in your direction. Horatio Bunce spoke of the little influence he had, Mr. Congressman. I've been working pretty hard this But everywhere I went, this humble man's name brought respect well, it's a to be and attention and allowed me opportunities to appeal to the people. I was fortunate to spend several nights with different members of my constituency and became reunited with a treasure of simple ways and simple talk. 
Most importantly, I was able to spend many hours with Horatio Bunce. We often talked of the principles and affairs of government. About a week later, at a big get-together... all those people there, Colonel Crocker. Got a good crowd for you to talk to. Fine crowd. About ready to talk to these good folks? Indeed I am. All righty. Folks, please gather around. I hope our congressman here won't mind if his podium is a supper for my cow tomorrow. <laughs> well, maybe you better ask the cow. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Colonel Crockett? Fellow citizens, or rather friends and neighbors, in this book, there's a proverb that says, before honor comes humility. You're looking at a man who's eaten of that apple. Now, many of you I've come to know well during the past couple of weeks, and my eyes have been opened up to truths which ignorance or prejudice or pride had hidden from my view. I want to acknowledge publicly what I've been telling some of you privately. I made a mistake. I voted for an appropriation of money which was unconstitutional and morally wrong. I see now that my error has or will cost you in multiple ways. I understand more clearly how destructive a noble cause can become when it's under the direction of a misguided politician. And a cocky one at that. I will never make that same mistake again. Now, I, uh, I had planned to ask for your votes today, but I cannot. I simply ask for your forgiveness, not only as a congressman, but as a human being. Thank you. Mr. Congressman, those honest, hearty shouts and the trust on the faces of those simple but wise people have meant more to me than all the honors I have received and all the reputation I have ever made. And that is why, sir, when you introduce the bill to aid the widow of that distinguished naval officer, I must vote no for I cannot contribute to another act of unconstitutionality. I shall offer a suggestion that instead of an illegal appropriation to a charity case, that I as the first offer one week's salary to a private fund. And I'm sure that if every member of Congress will do the same, it will amount to more than the bill initially intended. Sincerely, Colonel David Crockett. When Congress begins to stretch its power beyond the boundaries of the Constitution, there is no limit to it. The Constitution neither defines charity nor stipulates the amount. You are at liberty to give whatever you think proper to whomever you darn please by giving what is not yours to give. <laughs> 